Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. We'd really appreciate it if you'd like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Well, handling the bad pass that he got. Yeah, and, no, yeah, was, Cole, yeah. Cole's not a passer, <laughs> but uh, I think uh, uh, I had a better opportunity on the one-timer, and I think he recognized that. So, yeah. yeah, for sure. You opened up and picked up that. Good thing it didn't bounce puck. over my stick or you <laughs> oh. never hear the end of it. <laughs> when I stepped on the ice, I never backed down, and I never stayed down. And I was vicious, and I was malicious. And I don't care. <laughs> I'm alive. He's a freaking madman. Look at him going to town. That'll be a suspension. That'll be a fine. I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. Nick, welcome to the Raw Knuckles podcast. Awesome that you took the time today to join Tim and I. Um, God, um, when I think back, I think back... Uh, of when this big trade was made here in Montreal, Max Pacioretty heading one way and you coming the other. Max going to Vegas, you coming along with Thomas Tata here to Montreal. Now, a young kid who's been drafted by an organization, the Vegas Golden Knights, uh, first round pick, must have been exciting. And you don't even really get a taste of what that organization is all about and you get traded how difficult was that on you but being such a young kid uh yeah it was pretty uh difficult to kind of soak in the trade uh, i wasn't really expecting that uh obviously when you get drafted in the first round you almost think that you're going to be spending your whole career with one team at least that's the goal and um yeah, it just didn't work out that way and um uh, but i'm very lucky and fortunate to be in montreal and going to be happier here so um the draft okay but uh, let's go back to where it all began and that's in london ontario um uh, and getting involved in hockey you have a younger brother ryan you you guys are a year mm-hmm. apart actually happy birthday too tomorrow is your birthday uh, i saw <laughs> yeah, it is. You, you... <laughs> that was a that was uh, a long time ago tomorrow. for you Nux. Uh, old man a long he's time be... ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was <laughs> A long time ago is right. But uh, going back to London and growing up there, how did you get involved in hockey? Did dad, mom and dad get you involved in hockey? Did they take you to night's game, stuff like that? How, how, how did hockey go, uh, come yeah. on the radar? Yeah, that's pretty much how it goes in London. Um, my dad always played uh, growing up and then kind of stopped uh, through after university. Uh, but my mom never knew, really knew anything about hockey or watched it that much. But, uh, so it was mostly my dad and obviously with the Knights in town, uh, it's very easy to see hockey and be around it. And, uh, that's kind of my, some of my earliest memories are just at the rink with my dad and my, my brother. So, uh, yeah, it's been a long road, but, uh, it all started in London and it's definitely thanks to my dad. Yeah, well, you played in that Alliance, you won Alliance Hockey Player of the Year award. You won uh, as a young kid. You played with your buddy Isaac uh, Radcliffe. Are you and Isaac still good buddies? And um, growing up with him, how was that? Did you push each other? Was your brother Ryan in that group, or did you play with him growing up? Oh, yeah, me and Isaac are uh, still really good friends. Um, so we, when I was uh, probably – five we met Isaac and he actually just lived up the street from me so uh, we were always in the same neighborhood and uh, ended up going to school together later and then we actually lived together in Guelph when I got traded there in junior so uh, we've uh, spent a lot of time together and definitely pushed each other and uh, just happy to see where he is in his career and uh, I think he'll be uh, probably a mainstay NHL or pretty soon. Well that'd be awesome if he if he uh, certainly uh, makes it and you end up playing against them one day. It'd be awesome. You know, I looked on your uh, Wikipedia page and um, it said on there how you suffered from a number of childhood illnesses. Um, uh, how difficult was that going through the thing? It says here, yeah, hand, foot, mouth disease, pneumonia, respiratory, cynical, uh, cynical, 
virus and ear infections. <laughs> it, they, they make it sound like um, you had a really <laughs> difficult time growing up. I don't know physically. I, I don't know why that's on Wikipedia, but uh, I think that was more so when I was like one and two. So okay, I didn't really have to deal with it. Obviously, my parents got the worst of it, but I don't. I don't remember having any of that stuff. So well, why is uh, that in there though? That is uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> You had a hard first six months someone, of your life. Someone is really happy about putting that in my Wikipedia page. I guess. Funny. We got to correct that. We got to take that out of there. Then. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, growing up in London, yeah, and uh, having the nights around and seeing it all the time. So you you, you end up um, going to the OHL and you end up in Owen Sound to start. Uh, the, the step up from Alliance uh, Hockey Player of the Year and going to junior was that a big step for you or did it seem like a you know kind of seamless transition to junior hockey from when i first showed up in on sound uh to the end of my rookie season i think i just grew a ton uh, as a player and i had a lot of great help from a lot of uh leaders and uh coaches on you know on sound uh, we weren't that great uh my rookie season so uh, I was able to play a lot, uh, play in every position and every role. So uh, it was great for me. And uh, that was probably one of the biggest years for my development. Yeah, that first year, right? Uh, in Owen Sound, mm -hmm. 2015, 2016. Uh, then you rip it up the next two years. You throw some good numbers up. And um, you end up um, in 2018, 2019, getting traded uh, during the season. Now, Going from Owen Sound to Guelph, um, how difficult was that for you being there for four years and then jumping over to Guelph? Obviously, a, a playoff-bound team, a good hockey team, and they wanted to add that piece and add you, and it certainly paid off. You did not win the Memorial Cup that year, but uh, ended up uh, getting pretty close, losing to Ruane Noranda. Uh, how difficult is that? at that point after being in Owen Sound and then having to leave after you know, spending your whole junior career there? Yeah, it was uh, definitely pretty sad. Uh, just building all the relationships that I did in Owen Sound. I had great billet parents, uh, great coaches, uh, great teammates there. Uh, we had two great runs in the in the playoffs with Owen Sound the uh, years before. And uh, we weren't in the kind of that position. We were more in a almost rebuilding stage, but had a lot of veterans that wanted to make another run. So um, I just thank uh, Dale DeGray there and Owen Sound for uh, trading a few of us to Guelph for one last chance of getting the OHL championship. And uh, lucky enough, we did that. And, uh, I had a ton of fun in Guelph, but uh, pr pretty much all of my uh, junior memories are in Owen Sound and uh, the great people there. Didn't you? Did So who did you grow up like, uh, I guess – what players did you like want to, you know, was the London Knights, you guys always had like great teams with like Patrick Kane and a bunch of guys, right? Where was, who were <laughs> some of those guys you looked up to? Uh-huh. We always had great players in London. Uh, they always do such a great job uh, drafting and recruiting and development there. And uh, yeah, like Patrick Kane, uh, Sam Gagne. I remember uh, Corey Perry, my former teammate, we're just watching him in London. Um, other guys like, shrimp uh had an amazing uh career in london there he's a ton of fun to watch but uh all those guys and then even uh when i was older uh, a lot of great nhlers that i get to play against today so uh they do a great job over there i met mom and dad uh, at medusa and i've talked to your dad on a few occasions and and <clears throat> then getting to speak with you um uh, at the draft and before the draft there for the first time well a couple times saw you downtown Another time we talked briefly, but um, I, I, I'm looking back at uh, your time in the uh, OHL junior hockey and um, having met you though on those few occasions. And this this one thing really stuck out at me because you're you're mature beyond your years. Um, you, you you're a nice kid, and you were the most sportsmanlike player for three years straight in the <laughs> OHL the, the, you won the William Hanley trophy. Are you destined to win the lady Bing one day? Uh, looks like it from the past there. 
uh wasn't really planned uh to win it three years in a row it kind of almost lucked into that um uh, but i guess teams uh were voting for me uh, on the other side which i'm very thankful for and uh to win it three years in a row is pretty special and it's probably going to be kind of hard to do again so i always have that yeah I, knock you ever knock you ever try to win the lady no i not at all i always <laughs> lost it you weren't you weren't close no i always <laughs> lost it the first game of the season uh when we played against the bruins but um yeah i mean yeah, obviously i could the short time i knew you um certainly like i said mature beyond your years um coming here to montreal the first time and i remember the training camp i go back I first moved back here. Brendan Gallagher came to camp the first year, and he's one of the guys that stuck out for me right away. Uh, a little pain in the ass, running around. Man, who is this guy? Because I've been away from the game a little bit. I haven't been watching it, and he's the first guy who caught my attention. Obviously, you caught my attention, your first training camp. And I remember watching you out there, and I kind of – and again, you're 18 years old. And mm-hmm. and I, I'm trying to put myself in those shoes. I came, I was 20, just turning 21. And and I know how difficult in like in awe I was of being in the Montreal Forum and all these, you know, super players around me. I'm like, I, I was in awe of it. You kind of had that, to me, uh, that deer in the headlights a little bit uh, um, look at times when you're on the ice. And I could see how young you were, but there was also something else about you that I noticed that you could play. You had hockey sense. How, how, how like intimidating or, or, or difficult was that first camp when you came here? All of a sudden, I'm in Montreal, the mecca mm-hmm. of hockey. Yeah, it was uh, <laughs> definitely pretty intimidating. Uh, probably the first player I met was uh, Shea Weber. Uh, I had to go do medicals and fitness testing with like the NHL players because the rookies and younger guys had already done their testing. So they wanted me to come in and I had to jump in right away with the pros. So um, that was kind of, I was just kind of thrown into the fire there. And uh, yeah, that camp, uh, I thought I was playing pretty well, but uh, it was almost like I knew I was going back to junior in a way. Um, but the year after I came into camp, uh, knowing I had a great shot and I wanted to make the team. So uh, kind of two two different camps and uh, it's probably the way I'd tell younger kids now to come in there's always spots available and uh, you got to earn your spot and um, yeah just like I did and uh, even my second camp people didn't expect me to make the team and I uh, had a great camp and uh, they had no choice but to keep me around. Knox well, you have what did you did you what was did you have any fitness testing in your training camps? No I had fitness testing my last year um when i retired and after i took the fitness test i knew it was time to retire <laughs> believe me <laughs> uh you guys used camp to get in shape, yeah, right? yeah, yeah yeah we did we did that's what it was back then right you can't i i used to come back can't to, do that anymore i lived i lived year round in montreal after my first two years here and um we would start skating like you know the end of August, beginning of September, just before camp. And we get on the ice maybe two weeks before camp and then use camp to get in shape. Played a lot of games. Uh, we used to have like seven to 10 exhibition games. It was ridiculous. But um, yeah, and guys were a little fat and overweight when we came to camp. But well, no, I asked that because it's like, you know, I didn't, ha- I was, a, you know, I had a cup of coffee, but I used to stress out. Like I'd use, like I would stress out for the fitness testing. I would be like all summer, like worried about it. And then like it's, it's one day, it's like an hour long. And then, you know, like I was eating like Wendy's after, like you were just, <laughs> you know what I mean? So do you guys do any, is there any tests that you dread doing? Um, You know, looking in the training camp, is there any hard tests you guys do? Um, Last, I think the, they sent us all the tests that we're going to be doing. Uh, nothing too crazy. Uh, I think there's a skate test that's probably going to be the hardest, but um, nothing too crazy in the gym. All kind of standard stuff. But I've heard some nightmare uh, tests that guys are always stressing about on other teams. Here was my test the last year. And I Pat Burns was the coach. I got traded back here. And Burnsy uh, called me. The night before, well, the afternoon before uh, the test, the day before. And he said, hey, you want to go for dinner with me? I said, sure, I'll go for dinner. Well, we went for dinner. 
And then we went out to a club afterwards called the Pasha Club. And we stayed there till four in the morning. And I kept telling him, I said, I'm worried about the test. And Burns, he's like, I'm not, I don't fucking care about the test for you. You know, just go there and, you know, do one sit up, do one push up. Anyway, (laughs) we had to skate a mile. And we did all the testing. Then the last thing we had to do was skate a mile. And I would skate with Cabano, who was my line mate for years. And I had just come back. And Cabo lapped me. And when he lapped me, I said, you know what? I think the end is near. And it was. That was my last season. So that was the extent of my test. And I thank uh, Bernsey for um, for burning me out the night before. Keep me out till four in the morning. But... Um, so, so you come to camp in, in, in that first camp and you go back to junior and you have that run and you go to the, the um, semifinal, the Memorial Cup. How big a year was that for you from a personal growth standpoint when you came back to that second camp with the Habs? Yeah, it was uh, massive. I felt like a totally different player coming back from my second camp, um, more confident, um, stronger I uh, wasn't uh, skating with more pros in the summer trying to get ready to be just be around that environment and uh, that really helped a lot but that that season uh, we went so far and had I got so much experience playing in big games and uh, against teams top competitions so uh, that year was huge for me and uh, had a great run with Guelph to the final and into the Memorial Cup which was a lot of fun yeah it was and you play well in that um Certainly no question about it. And you come to you come to training camp with the Habs, like you said, the second time and and you felt like you had a good shot to make the team. And there was a big difference in Nick Suzuki that second camp. And you end up coming in and making um a spot for yourself. Coming in and then, you know, certainly the pandemic and all that stuff happening, um, it, you know, it had to be difficult. But uh, how key was it to to have those that core group around you, the Gallagher's, the Shea Weber, the Kerry Price, the leadership in that room? Like we hear a lot of people, you know, I certainly you hear a lot of people on the radio or in the media who say, oh, you know, I don't want a guy that's good in the room. I want a guy that's good in the ice. They don't understand the value mm-hmm. of someone like a Shea Weber in that room. Can you kind of let the people know? just how important it is to have someone like him and Kerry Price certainly in that room uh, leading the way. Oh, yeah, it's super important. Um, I could pretty much go ask Webby for anything. Uh, places outside of hockey to go to, like where to, I don't know, where to shop, where to eat, everything around the city, um, looking for apartments. He has a guy looking. <laughs> if I needed anything, he seemed to have a guy for it. So, um all those older guys do such a great, did such a great job with me. Uh, just welcomed me in right away, uh, knowing I could be comfortable with them and not trying to step on any toes and just be a good rookie and uh, do my thing. And uh, all the guys, I think, respected me for the way I worked as a rookie and uh, just had a level head and stayed humble and all the stuff like that. So I think I did a good job of just knowing my uh, place as a rookie and not trying to do too much. That's awesome. Yeah, awesome Nux, right? That. that just sounds, you know, that's like the yeah. old school mentality. I love it. Because Nux loves all the new school stuff. He loves the iPads. He loves all the <laughs> video games. So, no, it's refreshing to get, a, you know, an old school kind of mentality. That's great. That is. Like, because, again, for young kids to come in and, you know, I, I geez, I remember Alfie Turcock coming in, young kid. He, he, a good, good little guy, but he was a cocky little bass. And I'm like, this kid doesn't have a clue. <laughs> what the hell is going on here, right? And a guy like Weber, obviously seeing that, I'm sure they put put someone in their place pretty quick, but uh, you strike me anyway as a humble kid and, and, and certainly understand that pot, that locker room dynamic. But let's talk about in the room, though, Shea Weber, when, mm-hmm. when things get tough, because there was some shit going yeah. on with this team, you know, and here you are, a young kid coming in and, You've already had fucking three coaches, right? Yeah, yeah. Julian, uh, Dusham, and now uh, Marty. But you know that's that's a lot for young. I remember, at, you know, changing coaches, how it affected the team, and it always gave the team a boost in that. But you get it, 
get used to all, you know, new way of doing things. And mm -hmm. you at a young age, having those three coaches, how, how did like Shea Weber and the leadership group in that, that, that room kind of make that transition for you guys a, a little bit better when you're dealing with those tough times? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, all the leaders that I've had, especially even that uh, second year when we had a big run, uh, I always talk about Perry and Stahl and Webby and Carey, uh, Galley, uh, all these guys that I got to just watch, um, see how, see what they do on a daily basis. They're always leading by example and uh, not always the biggest talkers, but um, when something needs to be said, uh, they know the exact thing to say and, and in the right time. And uh, that's something that I've always uh, respected. And uh, you don't have to be a big rah-rah guy, but uh, when it was time to buckle down and pairs and Stalzy and Webby were always speaking up and uh, calmed us down and got us motivated for all these games. Yeah, that's good to hear. A lot of people don't understand that dynamic in the locker room and how important it is. Um, yeah, I mean, so if you had if you had 20, 20 year olds, uh, <laughs> they'd have no <laughs> idea what you're doing out there. So uh, you always yeah. need that veteran leadership, guys that have been through it. Uh, I mean, we had some of the best leaders that uh, are in the NHL. So uh, it was pre pretty cool for me. Yeah, there's no question about it. Um, I know I had the same when I came here, Bob Gainey, Serge Havad. I had some of those those Hall of Famers that just they're invaluable in the locker room. There was stuff I, I, I just didn't have a clue about when I got here in uh, the pro game. And uh, those guys certainly helped in a big way, and they are invaluable. So um, I want to get to um, – the bad pass you got from Cole Caulfield because and that yeah. <laughs> and that that stint that run to the Stanley Cup final and just how huge that was for yeah. this not only for the you for this team this city though what they had become accustomed to over the years and it, it, again it, you know they they were certainly spoiled and it's been so long that for this fan base. Uh, to get back to where they believe this team should be. But to be on that run, and let's just go down 3-1 to the Leafs. And we sent our secret agent in, Alex Galchenyuk, <laughs> and we had him fucking give the puck away. Thank you, Alex. But it, it, Cole said, geez, I, you know what? We had him on, and he said, you know what? I should have shot it, but I gave him a shitty pass. <laughs> but you picked it up. Like, how how huge was that? And, and right there, that series turned on that dime right there. Yeah. And the rest is history. How, how cool was that for you? Yeah, it's uh, probably one of the bigger goals that I've ever scored. And um, you could kind of tell right away after the game uh, that we just had a ton of confidence and swagger going back to Montreal. And uh, we knew we weren't going to lose that game at home and especially having fans back in the arena for that one. And, uh, we knew if we took them to seven, um, we had a pretty good shot. So, uh, yeah, it was kind of the turning point, I think, for the series. Obviously, uh, we had a, a lot of great plays, and uh, Carey kept us pretty close for every game, and uh, we were able to win a uh, big series against the Leafs. How did how did you handle personally, like, the no fans? Was that, like, weird for you? Like, I know a couple guys said it was, you know, a little bit different like if you have to do something extra to get yourself up for a game i know it's playoffs i know you're young but like mm -hmm. was there an effect on that with you personally uh i think we just got used to it throughout the regular season uh it was definitely really weird at first but i think you just kind of became numb to it um but then once we had fans again it was like how do we ever play without these guys and <laughs> yeah. uh it just brings such a different atmosphere and uh energy to the games and uh yeah once we kind of got them back in the building it was so much fun and it gave us a ton of energy and uh kind of carried us through into this final yeah you know watching that it get, brought back memories for me certainly of patrick watt and what he did carry price but not just patrick the team because the overtime goals um yeah kk in game six mm -hmm. scoring that old t goal and certainly not here now but and then winning uh Game seven, three one, and looking at game seven, and you've played in them in junior, mm -hmm. but in the NHL, 
And now you are on the road in Toronto. Looking back, and I always say it, game seven, sure, I'd rather play at home, but there's no pressure on the road team. There's yeah. just all the pressure was on Toronto. And they certainly, and not to take anything away from the Habs and what you guys did in that game seven, but the, but they were just, they had tight ass. They were, they were fucking nervous and it showed and you guys just fucking took advantage. It was incredible. Now, how'd you feel going that game? That confidence? Could you sense the other side had the pressure? Uh, yeah, we uh, obviously based on the season and expectations they had coming into the season, uh, the pressure seemed to be all on them. Uh, obviously they, they're a great team. They're super hard to play against uh we all we have all the respect for them and um but going in we felt like we had a great group we didn't really accomplish what we thought we could have in the regular season and uh we had a bunch of guys uh that were ready to to win and we got healthy at a, a good time and uh we had pretty much the full lineup available to us and uh yeah it's it was a crazy series and that game seven i just felt uh Everyone was calm. No one was, I didn't feel like anyone was nervous. Obviously there's a bit nerves, but didn't show throughout the room. We were relaxed, having fun. And uh, that confidence and swagger definitely came through in the game seven. Tim, do you ever play in a game seven? I never played in an NHL playoff game. I had shooty line mates, Nick. You know, I say this all the time, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> surrounded by losers. Um, no, I <laughs> obviously I didn't play long in the NHL. I played in a couple game sevens over in, obviously Europe and stuff, but I, you know, it's not obviously not the NHL, but it's playoffs. And I think all of playoffs suck. Like it's hard, you know? Um, yeah. But no, it's pretty cool. You got to do that. And obviously, um, would you say that was the biggest goal in game six that you ever scored? Well, handling the bad pass that he got. Yeah, and, no. Yeah, was, Cole, yeah. Cole's not a passer, <laughs> but uh, I think uh, uh, I had a better opportunity on the one timer. And I think he recognized that. So. Yeah. yeah, for sure. You opened up and picked up that. Good thing it didn't bounce puck. over my stick or you <laughs> oh, never hear the end of it. You wouldn't oh, be on I here. Know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. So, and I just want to go, I don't want to get bogged down, on, but I want to go through. How about Winnipeg sweeping them? That, I mean, I think right there, you guys just shocked the hockey world. Not just everybody back here, but you shocked mm -hmm. the hockey world with that. And I wanted to ask you specifically about the hit on Jake Evans and and, and what that did to your group and, and how everybody reacted to that. Yeah, I think it definitely uh, bonded us tighter. Uh, obviously, Jake's an uh, amazing guy, uh, well-respected in the room. Everyone loves him. And uh, to see that hit uh, was pretty scary. And uh, we were just hoping uh, he was going to be okay and uh, wasn't uh, injured too badly. He went off on the stretcher and no one really knew until after the game uh, was over. So uh, we just wanted to win that for him and then get back in the room and see how he was doing. And um, thankfully, he was doing pretty good walking around with us and um, he didn't have to go uh, stay out that long. I don't remember if he came back uh, a couple games or the yeah. next game. Yeah, it was a couple. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that was scary hit to see. And I've been there before seeing guys taken off on the stretch it doesn't matter if it's your team or the other team but that was scary and uh it's good he's back that kid so you you blast through winnipeg and it, again like i said shock the hockey world and um then you head back to the team that didn't want me and uh, <laughs> I, I, that i mean that had to be for you, just such a great feeling because I, like I said, I know Max and I looked at Max's face there and I, you know, I couldn't help but feel bad for him, but I really didn't in the <laughs> scheme of things. But it had to be so gratifying for you, a young kid. You get traded from that team. They drafted you. They trade you. You didn't even get to play a regular season game with them. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to see him in the playoffs. It, it had to be just a great feeling. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, definitely extra motivation. Um, but I think my first my first two games of that series didn't go too well. <laughs> and I wasn't really happy with uh, my game for those two. But And you uh, let us know it too, right? I, yeah. I, I got to say that, uh, uh, Tim, like when when Nick has had a tough outing, 
he's probably harder on himself than anybody. And he, he's honest about his game. And anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, I think I think I was like minus four or five, and I was like a bunch of face-offs that I lost, and they went right into our net. I'm like, oh, man, this is uh, not going how I was planning it. But, uh, yeah, I think we uh, we had a good – I mean, the whole series was tough. Uh, they are a great team. They have a ton of great players, and um, just uh, the opportunity to – try to take out the team that traded uh traded you before uh it was pretty cool and um yeah it doesn't that doesn't happen that often and then we go to the stanley cup final but going up against tampa um powerhouse that they were uh how did how did you guys feel did you did you sense a little bit of uh trepidation maybe going into that series as a group or was the confidence level still high yeah, it was, it was definitely still high. Um, we beat uh, three really good teams on our way to the final, and uh, we knew Tampa had an amazing uh, regular season there and obviously uh, winning the Cup the year before and um, having all the great players that they did. Uh, but the conference was still there, and um, the first game didn't go too great. Um, but then that second game, we lost, but I thought, uh, we played a lot better than them. Just a few bounces didn't go our way. And uh, I think if we were able to win that game, the series could have been a lot different, obviously. But, um, yeah, I think we matched up pretty well against them. Um, but, yeah, didn't go our way in the series. And uh, But the confidence never uh, got away from us. How about for you on a personal level, um, the experience overall and the growth uh, – in that playoff season and in, in doing it. Yeah. Certainly having those veterans around, but with some mm -hmm. new young blood in this organization, Cole and company. Yeah, it was uh, an amazing experience for all us young guys. Uh, not some players never get that opportunity to go that far in, in their careers. And uh, we want to get back there. And uh, that's our number one goal. And uh, just for me, uh, the experience of going that far uh, playing, playoff hockey against uh, the best competition in the world uh, gave me a ton of confidence going into the next year and my uh, hopefully a uh, long career and the next playoff opportunities. And uh, we know we can get it done. Uh, I think our team's uh, going in the right direction where we'll be competing every year. And uh, that's the main goal for all of us. So um, you come out of your uh, entry level contract, you sign a nice big contract uh, and deservedly so and listen a lot of people will look at the contract and say oh it's too much too soon um uh, it could be more down the road who knows so i i think it's a very fair contract you got um and based on what you've done here in the short time uh the leadership you've shown and um the your on ice ability what you've given to this organization already um, I think it's a very fair contract both ways. That being said, that being said, um, <laughs> that being said, do you, you think it was too much too soon? <laughs> no. Well, no, go kidding. ahead. Is that your question, Tim? Go no, ahead. I was just when you no, said that, I was like, yeah, not. he's probably the last person that's thinking like this is too much too soon. I'll pass on this. Of course, he's not. <laughs> no, and I'm I get kidding. that, but in this town, Tim, I know, like, I know, you get it's... picked apart big time, but. You know, too much too soon. No, the contract is fair, I believe, like I said. But you now coming into this season, I see you living in Montreal. There's talk of Nick Suzuki being the captain of the Montreal Canadiens one day. Now, listen, um, there's a young core here. And sure, there's a couple veteran guys here that have been here for a while that certainly could be considered. Um, that being said, are you ready to grab that mantle? And do you think if given that position, do you think you're ready for it is what I'm asking you. Do you think you're ready for it? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, we have a ton of guys that could wear the C and, uh, be great captains. And, uh, I have a ton of respect for all our, all my teammates and, uh, the guys that have been here, like Galley and, uh, he would be an amazing captain if he was given the C. And, uh, but if it was me, um, 
I think I could be, I would definitely be ready for it. Uh, I think I've learned a ton over my uh, three years here already. And uh, I've had guys to learn off of, uh, obviously like Galley and Webby and uh, Pricey and uh, all the guys I mentioned before through the playoff runs. And uh, I've seen uh, a great captain like Webby and how he handled himself. And, and I think I could do a pretty good job in that role. And uh, obviously being with a younger team, um, who knows? And, uh, but I'd definitely be ready uh, for that if that came. You ever been a captain? Uh, yeah, I've been. Uh, I was captain in minor hockey and nice. junior. So I've, I've worn the seat before, but obviously it's uh, a bit different. And uh, they take it uh, very seriously here. And uh, I'm sure the decision is uh, not taken very lightly. Now, Nick, we just had Max Patch already on, who was the captain here. A lot of people looked at Max and said, boy, you know, he's a great goal scorer. Um, they thought it might have affected him uh, on a nightly basis when things weren't going well offensively, right? You mm-hmm. lose it a little bit. You don't score a few games. You start questioning yourself. And then all of a sudden, everybody's talking about you. Max, we had on last week. And uh, Max talked about that being in Montreal. He said, you know, I got to Vegas. And I was like, like, it was so different. I, I, I almost slid a little bit, he said, but I caught myself. He said, in Montreal, I had the pressure all the time, it, whether it was from the fans, um, uh, the, on the radio, my neighbors, uh, everybody. I had that pressure where I was constantly being pushed and had to, had to produce. He said, I got to Vegas, and it was almost like, well, no one's holding you accountable. Like, and he... he he said he caught himself and he really had to push himself that extra. Uh, how about that? Hearing that from Max, uh, do you feel like that outside pressures being captain can be a little much at times? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the fans uh, expect a lot from the team. Uh, we've been a winning franchise uh, for such a long time and uh, that's what they expect, and uh, that's what the players want. We want to win games, and um, I think everyone on the team is uh, pressured to do well, but obviously some guys uh, more than others. And uh, But I've always been a guy that puts a lot of pressure on myself, and I know what I'm not playing well, and I know what I'm doing well, and I don't let the media and uh, outside noise affect how I'm thinking about my game. And uh, I think uh, as a player, you have to individually uh, – uh self uh how do i say it self motivation uh, self yeah self motivate uh know where your game's at uh know how you're playing and uh not let anything outside of that affect you and it's all within the team and what the coaches are saying and uh that's pretty much all you can control and don't let that outside noise affect you and like for both you guys i guess like nux too i mean it's kind of like you have no choice like in a city like that it's like it's gonna happen right can you avoid the media? I mean, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> no. All, no, right? Not, Not when really, you wear but... the C. Yeah, especially yeah. not when you wear the C. I agree. Yeah, it's... yeah. You can't. You can't avoid them. Yeah. Um, obviously, they're they're doing their job. Uh, you're doing yours, and uh, you're just kind of meeting in the media room uh, and chatting for a little bit. But um, I think I've handled it really well uh, since I came into the team, uh, learning uh, from the older guys and what they do and uh, how they speak. So. I think I've done a great job of that and uh, just going to continue to uh, do that and uh, not really too not really too worried about uh, the outside affecting my play. Well, how about last year? Talk about staying healthy. You played every game last year, right? You didn't miss one, right? No. Uh, I mean, that <laughs> in this day and age, the, playing 82 games, like everybody always has something. Uh, I mean, that's a, a testament uh, – to who you are and, and, and certainly a fitness level, but your game. Um, how about this year? How cool was that for you to be at the draft? And I spoke to you at the uh, draft with Chris Weidman. We had a great talk. It was awesome talking to you guys. And, you know, we're standing in the room there. And I've been around it for years in this city. But everybody in the room is just – Tim, everybody in the room, and there's, you know, 50 to 75 people in there just staring at those two, you know, Chris and Nick. 
and 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 then uh, Jeff Gorton has you at the draft table, and then he has you up on the stage. Now, I asked you before. I said, well, "Who do you think you want another cinnamon here, or do you want a, a big uh, big winger?" And you um, declined to comment. You said you leave that up to management, which <laughs> very diplomatic answer. But they went and got the big guy. How? That Slavkovsky, I mean, it, you know, I, and I've seen a couple of clips of him and all that, but I've never seen him play live like a lot of people haven't. Some people yeah. are like, oh, you heard the, the when they announced his name, the whole place <laughs> went like, oh. But then they see this kid and they start to watch some clips of him on YouTube. Then they see him on the bike in the fitness test, almost tearing the bike up, almost drove the pedals off the bike. Yeah. Like, I mean, this bodes so well for you guys. And another young kid, but a kid with size to come in here because you know, having gone to the Stanley Cup final, the teams that stand at the end, man, you got to have some insulation there when you're a smaller team. And for years, this team had some smaller players with a few bigger guys. But it seems now you guys are getting bigger. Uh, and certainly with, with this kid on board, um, and you saw how important the big defensemen were going to Stanley Cup final. But up front, mm -hmm. you need them big forwards too. How excited are you and your teammates about this monster coming aboard who can <laughs> <Drago>. play hockey? <laughs> Drago. Yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah he's, uh, he looks like a specimen. I don't know what they're feeding those uh, kids over there in Slovakia, but uh, he's massive. I, I was talking to him uh before the day before the draft uh just on the ice with him and he's I, I don't know at 18 i didn't look anything like that so uh he's a really strong kid uh, super nice uh seems like he's a funny dude so uh i'm excited to get him in the room uh, i'm sure when he comes to montreal we'll take him out to dinner and get to know him a bit more and um but i think the, the guys are excited to add a guy like him and um yeah it was a cool experience going on the stage uh just experiencing the draft like that but uh yeah it was a ton how of was his night. english it's good yeah i think he, he took english classes in slovakia i'm pretty sure so his english is yeah, he already really well. good so he did yeah. speak well english um and and that's another thing um je parle français monsieur <laughs> Parlez-vous oh, yeah. français? Un petit peu. Huh? So, <laughs> are, have you gone to um, French class yet? Are they grooming you for uh, being <laughs> a took, totally uh, bilingual took, Nick Suzuki captain yeah, of the I Habs? Took French, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I took French in school for so long, but uh, in Ontario, they don't really like force you to use it anytime, just in French class. So, uh, I'm pretty good in uh, some areas, and but I can't really hold a conversation together. So, Nick, do you have a girlfriend now? Yeah. Okay, good. I was just curious in that. Way that's go, a good no. thing. <laughs> no, well, no, I, I didn't know. I got to ask him. I was going to say the best way to learn French is to get a French girlfriend. But that's out, so no you're going to have to go to class. <laughs> um, I'll take uh, I'll take an online course. There you go. Um, so here you are. Um, young hockey player in the NHL, making his way, certainly uh, opens a lot of eyes and, and you got so many people in this city that certainly love you. Um, three coaches already and um, all of a sudden, Duchamp is out and we're going to get a new coach, but who's it going to be? And then all of a sudden, a guy that is not on anybody's radar, anybody's radar, Except for maybe Ken Hughes and Jeff Gordon. Yeah, some peewee coach. Yeah. <laughs> like he's coaching Bantams. And listen, I've heard Marty speak on so many occasions, interviews, stuff like that. And he was always so well-spoken. And you could tell he, he had a mind for this game. And then he comes on board. What was it like that first? Because Chris Weidman said yeah. it. He, he was in, the first time he spoke to the players. And he said he just couldn't believe it. It was like one of the best things he ever heard from a coach. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, everyone saw how he spoke at the draft on stage in front of uh, 20,000 and a bunch of cameras. 
uh, that's kind of how he is in the dressing room. It's uh, pretty unbelievable. I was talking to uh, Le Cavalier there on the table, and I was like, Is he al- has he always been like this? And he's like, yeah, he's always <laughs> been good, great at speeches. So, um, yeah, that first day was unbelievable. I think I was just in awe of just seeing Marty St. Louis in our dressing room. Uh, and then I got really excited for him to be our coach. And just after that, uh, he kind of had the respect of everyone, and everyone was ready to go to work. And I kind of you could see it translate to the games and um, we had we started having a ton of fun and uh, playing a lot better and uh, there's some dark days that season but uh, after that uh, everything kind of went up uh, went uphill from there yeah it worked for Cole pretty good Did... <laughs> <laughs> yeah it worked all right that's awesome yeah Cole had a unbelievable second half there uh, we had a ton of fun playing together and uh, Marty let us pretty much play every single game together. So uh, it was a ton of fun, built a lot of chemistry, and uh, we're excited uh, moving forward together. So I said that, yeah, young Korea, three coaches. You have Claude Julian. You have uh, Dominic Duchamp. And I'm not trying to get you to say anything absurd or crazy, but how, like, what happened with Duchamp, Dominic Duchamp? Because all intents and purposes, the times I met him, nice guy. I get it. Mm-hmm. He he did well in junior as a coach, you know, coaching the national team. He comes, go to the Stanley Cup final. And then all of a sudden the next year, the wheels fall off. What happened there? Like, what was that feeling like in the room, like with you guys? Because it, geez, from a distance, and let's face it, 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 it didn't fucking look good. Yeah, obviously it's not only the coach's fault uh it was pretty much every player uh coaching staff um even trickled down to our like therapists and our strength coaches and everything and everyone was just in like a terrible mood pretty much all like the first half uh it was not that fun coming to the rink um no one was really playing well uh we were pretty much running the same systems and same practices as the year before, but I think uh, a lot of guys were drained uh, from the short summer. Uh, we didn't have Webby back. We didn't have Carry back. Uh, and obviously, those are two huge pieces. And then we had a bunch. We had an injury bug. I mean, felt like everyone was getting injured. Had a team uh, with pretty much. Uh, I think we had a game where we played. Uh, three guys were only making over a million dollars. So we pretty much had yeah. <laughs> guys on the minimum uh, that had just been called up. Uh, I think that was in Florida. Uh, so it was just kind of a perfect storm. A lot of the guys were calling it uh, of just bad luck. And uh, hopefully <laughs> we're on the other side of that for the next few years. Yeah, it tr- certainly seems like uh, And don't feel bad. Three guys making a million. Fuck, the whole team when I played didn't make a fucking million. <laughs> here, we, here we go. The old <laughs> no, yeah. no, 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 no. Here we go. Just a- okay, okay. No, don't give me the here we go. I know ne- that's one thing I never talk about. And I that, listen, that, this is their era. They're here. It's their time. And it's about fucking time that hockey players got paid the money they deserve because for years they didn't. I mean, even the guys before me, I had guys from the era before me, right, that would come in the room and they thought we were making big money, right? And, and we were compared to what, I mean, some of the guys that blaze away it's incredible. Yeah. Like Bobby Orr, like, come on yeah. what he did in the game. And then, but you know, that's, that's what it is today. And it, 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 this is a big business. We often hear it and hockey is a big business now. And it's jumped. Yeah. There was only six teams. Big way. When you played, there was only six teams, right? Nux? Or you're not that Tim. old. Sorry. <laughs> Tim. The original six. Tw- the, I played in the fucking original 24. <laughs> okay, it's the right. original. Sorry. It's the original 32 I read now. Your, okay? I read the dates wrong. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you did. But, uh, yeah, so so the new coach, and he's here, um, it seems like everybody uh, certainly benefited from that and took off. And now there's a whole new direction here. You're part of that. It's so, um, it's so cool to see that. Um, now, I, I do want to go backwards a little bit and and talk about your brother, uh, Ryan, being – he's with uh, the Hurricanes, right? He was drafted by the Canes. Yep. Um, uh, how about growing up with him? Was there always competition between you, tr- pushing each other, the two years? Oh, yeah. 
he got to look oh, yeah, up to sure. his big brother, right? I mean, you got to. Yeah. Well, it was, it was always competitive. I think uh, he got stitches probably uh, like four or five from mini sticks. So yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think I hit him from behind into foot, the wall. Foot, hand, and mouth though, is way worse or whatever. <laughs> oh, so so this sport, this being a good sportsman is is kind of you've grown into this. It took me a bit to get there. <laughs> it took yeah, you a while to get there. Um, but uh, yeah, we were competitive in everything: uh, video games, hockey, soccer, pretty much anything that we could do together. Uh, it got competitive. So uh, he was always a better road hockey goalie because I never played net. I was always shooting on him. So uh, yeah, but it was a we had a great childhood and uh, having each other uh it was a ton of fun and i uh, still talk to him all the time that's awesome um your mom and dad obviously did one hell of a job with you because you're a good young man you are uh and i i'm not bullshitting you i'm not just saying that you are a good young man <laughs> and having met mom and dad i can see why uh certainly uh, you know talk to your dad at the restaurant mom that first night i met them and um they did one hell of a job with you i don't know your brother but i'm sure uh, there's not much difference there when it comes to um, the substance of being. And um, that's that's awesome. Awesome to see. Um, so you're in Montreal now, year round. I love that. Uh, I remember Big Serge Savard when he was a general manager here. He wanted guys here because mm-hmm. I, it was always that way. The guys were from here. They, st- they were here all the time. Then guys from different... <laughs> places started playing here and he wanted guys living yeah, here year sure. round. He did. I think that's awesome for you. Um, let's talk about quick about the, the, the city and this city living here, the restaurants, the, the people, when you go out, I mean, it's like, l- listen, to some level I've dealt with it and I still deal with it today. And I, I love it. I love the people. I love the interaction. I'm a people person, but how about yeah. you coming here and just, like people freaking love you. They love you. That's awesome. It's got to be awesome feeling. Yeah. yeah, it's a ton of fun. Uh, I love meeting people uh, outside the rink, uh, whether I'm in the grocery store or out for at the restaurants and uh, wherever I am walking downtown. Uh, people are always uh, coming up and uh, want asking for photos and just wanting to chat with me a little bit, which is super cool. And uh, I have a ton of fun doing that and meeting new people all the time. And, um obviously the the team is such a big deal in the city and uh i love that about montreal and uh just to be playing in a market where there's that much passion and uh they know every single player uh all these stats where they're from everything like that uh just the the passion that the city has for the team is uh like none other and um all the guys uh love playing here and uh playing in front of these fans what's the handicap at we can look this up too. We can look. Don't be. We can look this up. <laughs> I think it's it's probably at like a ten. I don't do a great job of inputting my yeah uh, putting the good scores in. And... You just <laughs> 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 the bad um, ones where, where's uh that's a big pa- the thing you like to do right golf is that kind of what you do in your office? yeah I like golfing a lot. Um, I've played a bunch of amazing courses around the city. Uh, there's so many good ones uh, that I've been lucky enough to play. So I'm trying to hit uh, a lot of the uh, courses around here this summer. So, um, yeah, it's been a ton of fun. That's good stuff. Nick uh, Suzuki, I got to tell you, um, I think this organization certainly is in good hands and um, with the management staff, but also uh, with the great young core they have right now led by you. Um and we're going to see what happens here in the future. But um, if and when uh, you get named captain of this organization, uh, I truly believe uh, you're, you're ready for that job. And 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 I, I love the fact that you are self-critical and you're honest about your game. Because I had a coach, Jacques Lemaire, and Lemaire grabbed me one night after the game. He said, how do you think you played? Because this guy pushed me. He brought more out of me as a player. Listen, I fought. I never hide from that. But he helped me become a full-time NHL player. But he asked me one, how, how do you think you play? I said, I, I thought it was pretty good. He said, really? <laughs> he said, Chris, don't lie to yourself. Be honest with yourself. He said, here's what I'm going to tell you. There's 80 games in the season. You can have one of those games every 10 games. <laughs> 
And I'm like, wow, that's a tall order, right? So one every, so that's eight games out of 82. You can kind of have a shitty game. And really, yeah. it, you know what it did for me? It gave me something to shoot for. And I wouldn't let myself slip. I'd have a bad game and I'd be like, fuck, I got to change this. Yeah, I, you know, I got to play better. I got to do what's expected of me. And I can't take another game off. And I, And honestly, I felt I achieved that for the most part. Not always, but I, I strove for that. And it's a great goal to have. He was an awesome coach for me. And I know you got one right now. And um, listen, yeah, I, I wish you nothing but the best moving forward here. And I hope, I hope you one day get back to that Stanley Cup final. I was, I, I went once in 13 years, mm -hmm. one time it's hard. in 13 years. So yeah, very difficult and even more so now. So I wish you nothing but the best. And listen, everybody out there, if you like this episode, uh, of raw knuckles please like us follow us or subscribe if you can we'd really appreciate it nick suzuki awesome awesome um having you today i appreciate your time and uh you were generous with that and i wish you nothing but the best moving forward yeah thank you thanks guys for having me 